Anyone who has spent significant time studying true crime through books and documentaries has learned about certain people that put absolutely zero value on human life other than their own. Every time we think we've finally found the most vile, disgusting sociopath of all time, there's always someone even worse to learn about in another case. And today we'll be discussing the case of one of these kinds of people. And she is one of the worst of the worst. As the judge who sentenced her said, she is in a class all by herself. And this person is Stacy Castor. And she was more than your typical black widow who murders husbands for life insurance money. This woman was willing to frame and kill any and everyone to protect herself, including her own flesh and blood. I've seen serial killers. I've seen contract killers. I've seen murderers of every variety and stripe. But I have to say, Mrs. Castor, you are in a class by yourself. Timothy McVeigh was arrested by local authorities. Went to the guardrail. At the end of the guardrail, it was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack. And everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. Stacy Castor was born as Stacy Daniels in Clay, New York in 1967 and from outward appearances led a relatively normal life. She met her first husband, Michael Wallace, when she was 17 and they had two daughters together, Ashley and Bree. Everyone who knew her believed that she dearly loved her husband and daughters. Unfortunately, the marriage did have issues as the couple rarely saw each other because Stacy worked during the day as an ambulance dispatcher and Michael worked evenings as a mechanic. In 1999, he began to feel periodically ill. The normally healthy 38-year-old man would experience terrible coughing fits along with unexplained swelling. His doctor believed that it might be an inner ear disorder, but the exact cause was a mystery. Before Michael could seek more medical opinions, in early 2000, he passed away. Physicians determined that he had died of a heart attack. Michael's family members were understandably confused and wanted an autopsy, but Stacy refused to allow it, saying that the heart attack diagnosis was good enough for her. She collected $55,000 on a life insurance policy. In 2001, Stacy met David Castor, who she would marry in 2003, taking his name in the process. Not surprisingly, a life insurance policy was set up for her new husband as well, with Stacy being the beneficiary. Also not surprising, he quickly experienced a major health problem. On August 22, 2005, Stacy frantically dialed the police, saying that he had locked himself in his bedroom and wouldn't come out. When police arrived and kicked in the door, they found David dead, with an open bottle of antifreeze on the floor with a glass half full of what appeared to be antifreeze on the nightstand. Now both of Stacy's husbands had died relatively quickly after their marriage. This time the circumstances were even more suspicious, especially after police found a turkey baster that smelled like alcohol in the trash can. The baster also had traces of antifreeze and it had David's DNA on the tip. They also found Stacy's fingerprints on the glass, but not David's. Also, David's will left everything to Stacy and her daughters, but somehow nothing to his own son, David Jr. Detectives were convinced that Stacy murdered not only David, but also her first husband, Michael. Now, they set out to prove it. Detective Dominic Spinelli helped lead the investigation, and they began by setting up a camera watching over David's grave. Surely, if Stacy was really the grieving widow that she claimed to be, she would visit her husband's grave. She never did. Then they decided to exhume the body of Michael Wallace to do a proper autopsy. When someone experiences poisoning from antifreeze, crystals form in the victim's organs. Sure enough, Michael's organs were loaded with crystals. Tests proved that Michael also died of antifreeze poisoning. Detectives now knew that Stacy had murdered both her husbands. When they brought her in for questioning, a slip of the tongue removed any doubt. According to Detective Spinelli, I asked Stacy, do you remember which glass it was that you poured the cranberry juice in? And she looked at it and said, well, I poured the antifree. I mean, and then she stopped and said, I, I mean, I mean the cranberry juice. Stacy, regarding these glasses that were on top of the nightstand next to David's bed, you told us earlier that you had gotten David some cranberry juice and some water. By looking at the photo, would you be able to tell me 
which glass it was that you brought into David. Stacy leaned into the photo, was looking at it, at which time she said, when I poured the antifree, I need a cranberry juice. As it turned out, she actually believed antifree was the way that you pronounce the word antifreeze, which would be important later. By 2007, the evidence had been piling up and Stacy Castor knew it. She knew that they had exhumed David's body and discovered that he had also died of antifreeze poisoning. Instead of just hiring a lawyer, going to trial to face the charges, or negotiating a plea deal, Stacy decided to execute a diabolical plan that would get her off the hook, but it would include framing and murdering her own daughter. After Ashley Wallace was informed that her father had died of antifreeze poisoning, she was understandably upset and wanted answers. Stacy tried to calm her down, and after asking questions about what was said between Ashley and the detectives, she invited Ashley to have drinks together and relax as she had had a quote-unquote hard day. Ashley agreed as she trusted her mother and considered her her best friend. Stacy made her a mixed drink. It tastes terrible, but Ashley drank it anyway. The following day, the same thing happened again. Stacy made Ashley a drink that was disgusting. According to Ashley, nasty. She encouraged Ashley to drink it anyway, saying use a straw, put it towards the back of your throat so you don't taste it. Ashley trusted her mother so much that she didn't suspect a thing and drank anyway. Then she felt tired and went to lay down. 17 hours later, Bree found her sister Ashley comatose in bed. She told her mother about it and demanded that they call 911, which Stacy, to Bree's shock, was hesitant to do. Finally, she relented and called 911, but not before sneaking an apparent suicide note next to Ashley, which confessed to the murders of both Ashley's father and stepfather and said that she was now taking her own life. Medics were able to save her just in time, and when detectives explained to her what happened, asking her about the note, she was completely baffled. I did not try to kill myself, nor did I leave a suicide note, she said. What actually happened is clear as day. Stacy Castor fabricated the suicide note and attempted to murder her own daughter so that she would take the fall for the murders of both Michael Wallace and David Castor. When Michael died, Ashley was only 11 years old. Investigators found several drafts of the suicide note on Stacy's computer and the timestamps proved that they were written while Ashley was at school. It was also unique as a suicide note in that instead of describing remorse and the reasons why she was taking her own life like most suicide notes, the main focus of the note was assurance that Stacy was innocent, a theme that was repeated 14 times in the note. The grammar of the note was also much weaker than Ashley's grammatical ability as she was a very strong writer, but the letter was not written by a strong writer. And for even more proof, the word antifreeze was spelled antifree, which is how Stacy incorrectly pronounced it during interviews. The evidence proved that not only did Stacy try to kill her own daughter, but she killed David over the course of four days, slowly poisoning him with antifreeze, force feeding him with a turkey baster to make it look like a suicide. On December 20th, 2007, Stacy Castor was finally indicted, not only for murder, but also for the attempted murder of her own daughter. The case went to trial and Stacy's attorney had no other argument other than to try to say that Ashley, who had no history of mental illness, murdered both her fathers using antifreeze, including her biological father when she was just 11 years old. Ashley testified at the trial, explaining that she hated her mother for ruining so many lives, but also somehow loved her. She was understandably insulted at how the suicide note not only made her look like a murderer, but it also made her look stupid with all the grammatical errors. Even still, Stacy, when asked at the trial, blatantly blamed her daughter for killing both her husbands, despite all the evidence that proved otherwise. After my mom is sentenced today, I'll go back to my loving home with people who care about me. She's not going to go home. And if she hadn't chose to do these things, she could be home with me and Bree. I hate how she tried to make me look stupid in that note that she wrote. I've tried so hard to make something of myself. I have a 3.9 GPA and still she tried to make me look stupid. She was found guilty and sentenced to 51 years in prison. Stacy Castor may have also killed her own father 
as she visited him and brought him a can of soda when he was in the hospital in 2002. He died very shortly after that visit, and Stacy was the executor of his estate. It would not be surprising at all to learn that she did murder her own father. As the assistant district attorney, Christine Garvey, explained at Castor's sentencing, she is cold, calculating, and without any emotion for what she has done. Stacy Castor places no value on human life, not even her own flesh and blood. To Stacy Castor, human beings are disposable. Stacy Castor died in her cell of a heart attack in 2016 and never did admit to the murders of her husbands and the attempted murder of her daughter, Ashley. Thank you for checking out this week's video on one of the most cold-blooded, emotionless killers in true crime history. For more videos like this on true crime cases as well as videos on other historical events and topics, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Have a wonderful day and we will talk to you in the next video. That ranks, in my judgment, as one of the most reprehensible things I think I've ever seen in the criminal justice system. I know that you maintain your innocence, but I'll tell you, in my view, the evidence of your guilt is overwhelming. Unlike many defendants who pass through my courtroom, you're not just a danger to the general public, you're a danger to the people who love you and are closest to you. And I believe that the sentence I'm about to impose will remove that danger once and for all.